Our Father, we, we bow before You. Thank You that we can come before You and call You our Father. We're thankful that we have Your only begotten Son as our mediator. We're thankful we have access to You. We need You. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit. We need You, Spirit of the living God, to help us now. We want to better understand the words that were prayed. Lord Jesus, You spoke these words while You were here on this earth. You spoke them to Your Father, our Father. And we are recipients of the answer to that prayer. We feel the responsibility to live out the burden of this prayer. And I right now feel my inadequacy to to really make these words clearer than they already are in the text. So I pray for your help that you would come upon the minds and the hearts of the men gathered here and help us together. And that I would be an instrument and I want to be yielded to you. And I pray that you would guide and that the result of this meeting tonight would be that we would have a, a greater experience of this unity for which Your Son prayed. And so we continue to look for the answer in the experience of our own lives. And so we ask for that help that we need tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Let's read the words together again that we read this morning. John 17, beginning at verse 20. Jesus prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on Me through their word, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in Me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent Me. And the glory which Thou gavest Me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and Thou in Me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent Me, and hast loved them as Thou hast loved Me. The language of our Savior and great High Priest in this prayer just prior to His crucifixion is extraordinary. And even discussing some of these words with brothers today since the morning service, I, I, I am reminded of my inadequacy to fully comprehend what is being said here, but something is being said. And so to the degree that we can understand it, to that degree we can be helped and blessed and encouraged and, and labor toward that for which Jesus is praying here, the experience of that which is ours, not because of us, but because of Him and because of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is not a general prayer for the whole world, like casting a net with some vain hope of success. Jesus isn't just casting up a prayer. He's praying 
as the great high priest, as an intercessor, as one who has heard of his father and will be answered. So whatever it is he's praying for, I think we can say there's a, a certainty that it's going to be answered. And I think that's one of the things that has affected us in our attempts to understand what he's saying. At least it's affected me in my attempts to understand what he is saying. We know he's praying for his disciples. And it's quite clear that he's, he's praying for his disciples, which, by the way, include all of us who believe the words of the apostle as we saw uh, the apostles as we saw this morning. Those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, the words that have been passed down to us from the apostles through this preserved word that have been made alive to us by the Holy Spirit. But the mission that He has given to us, it's very clear, is the world. Do you see that emphasis in the words that, he, that Jesus prays? There is, a, there is a focus beyond the disciples. A focus beyond those who believe. The focus is to the world. He says that the world may be affected in some capacity by the answer to this prayer. The world is clearly the focus of Christ's mission for His disciples. He said earlier in the prayer, in fact, I, I noticed it back in verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. Now, we're living out this life in the world. In fact, Jesus says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world in verse 15. We're left here. There's a purpose. There's a reason. And it's not just for you and me. It's not just for us as believers. It's not for us to just circle the wagons and rally around in a, a camp of believers only. Yeah. Something beyond that. There's something about that, but it's something beyond that. Yeah, and you see that he says in verse 18, as thou has sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So you see the, the burden of, of Jesus as He prays is, is broader than just Israel, of course. It, it's going beyond. It's going to the Gentiles. It's going to the nations. It's, it's going to, to us. Oh, we have been the recipients of this prayer. The, the message has come to us. The, the gospel has come to us. And then he continues in the prayer repeating this emphasis toward the world which we'll make note of as we proceed in the message. So the burden of, of God. Let me, let me make this point too. I made it this morning, sort of reviewing here. But this prayer is, is a, the idea is a, it's a collective prayer. It's not for individuals. It's for us as we are united together, and um, you notice he uses the plural pronoun a, a lot there, that they, that, and, and he uses the word all, and, and so it's an inclusive prayer. A corporate emphasis is in the mind of Jesus, not isolated ministry. It's not my ministry. And let me just speak personally here. My own attitude when I go out into ministry, regardless of what it is, when I go to a prison or or out in some open air ministry, or in the pulpit at our church, or right now. I know. I just got goosebumps thinking about this. You didn't need to know that, but I thought I would share it. But, you know, that there are, I know, that I've already gotten texts. I'm praying for you as you minister, and for this group that's gathered here. I mean, there are those who are praying who aren't here, and I depend on that. I need that. In other words, what we are living out is a result of what Jesus is praying, a corporate effort in manifesting Christ in this world. But the burden of God here expressed by the Son to the Father in these verses, especially verses 21 through 23, is that every true believer in Jesus Christ be joined in a mutual bond with Him and with one another, that would be evident to the world. That the world would be able to see it, but the world would know it. 
And I believe that the world would be affected by it. I think that's the implication, that the world would be affected by it. As I've uh, looked at, meditated on these verses, and I frankly need to do further meditation, even reading over these verses today by myself, I'm, I'm crying out to the Lord, show me, show me what you're saying. You know, I, I feel that way. I feel somewhat helpless as I come to these verses. I, I thought, I've got to stand before these men and pretend like I know. Well, I don't want to pretend, but, you know, act like I know. You know, I've got the answer here. And frankly, I, I still struggle. I'm going to give you what I have. And hopefully, God will help us. But I, I, do, I do see somewhat of a progression here in these verses. And I just, again, this is a bit of review. But as Jesus prays in verse 21, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. I hear, I hear a, a sort of a, a, a positional sort of emphasis there, a, a, a sort of ultimate culmination uh, in, in Jesus' thought. And I, I understand this to be the result of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, as I said this morning, at conversion. I believe that's where that takes place. And we're joined together by the Spirit. I mean, the, the emphasis of Scripture is that we, we have the same Spirit. If we're believers, we have the Spirit of Christ. Christ, we don't have a... There's no multiplicity of spirits. There's one God. So there's, there's one Spirit, unless there is another Spirit in us. And so on that, that level, that there is a, there's a unity that we have that, as I said this morning, we didn't create. That's of God as His Spirit comes upon us and to us. We are joined together by... The Spirit who is one with the Father and the Son. And that's how it is that God is in us, I, I, I believe. By way of the Spirit. That's verse 21. 22, he adds to that, And the glory which thou hast given me. So, so that, that Spirit in us is fundamental. If you don't have that, forget unity. Unity. It, godly unity will not exist, okay? But then there's this glory which Thou gavest me. I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. And I said this morning that I, I think this is talking about that family relationship that we have as children of God. We have been pronounced children of God. We've been given the spirit of adoption. So we are the sons of God, the children of God. And we have that in common, every single one of us. I'm no more a child of God than you are if you are a child of God. We're in the family. We're part of the family. Amen. And that can't change. God won't renege on that. God won't take back His fatherly relationship to us. If He has adopted us, if we have been adopted, that's a sure thing. Amen. And so every true believer has a relationship because there's been a glory that's been given to us. Jesus has given to us the glory which was given to Him. The Father pronounced Him my Son. He has pronounced us His sons, His children. And so we share in that glory. We have the same Father. We have the same elder brother. We have a lot of differences. But there is a never-changing foundation for unity, for this essential unity that needs to be worked out in a practical unity. And that is, we are children of the living God. We saw that this morning. And then verse 23, I, I see this to be the more practical side. I, I see a, a flow here. You have, the, you have the fundamental, essential unity because of the Spirit because we're the children of God. We have this relationship. And then he says, I in them, and thou in me, that, or in order that, they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And this seems to be the more practical experience of the oneness that is ours positionally. 
Because we are one in Christ, we have the same spirit, we're part of the same eternal family, the goal is that we be perfected, made perfect in one. That we relate to one another as one, experiencing progress in unity in practical ways until that glorious day that will, all of the perceived differences that we have will vanish. Did you know that in eternity we'll not be discussing our differences? That almost seems, some of you may say that takes the fun out of life, but no, no, I think that's a good thing. You know, there's going to be something glorious about that. I mean, don't, don't you love it when you have a brother or a sister in Christ that you know you are so close together, there's hardly any differences. Isn't that, there's something, I mean, that's probably why you joined the church you joined. You know, you, you, had, this, you, were, you, you had this sense that I'm one with these people, you know, and, and you love that sense of unity. You, you love that bond that you feel and experience in that relationship, or at least you should. And I would argue that is one of the primary goals that we should have in our relationships as believers, in particular, in particular as they are worked out in our local churches. You see, it's not enough that this unity exists in the mind of God. You know, we as, because of our certain theological persuasion, we like to talk a lot about the mind of God and eternity and, you know, it's always been and always will be and we love the theoretical and we, you know, we wax eloquent and deep and we love to listen to those who can go deep with those things, you know, and, and then we smack our wife on the way home from church. You know, we, we're quick to speak in some harsh way to a brother or sister who gets in our way. And what I'm saying is it's not sufficient that we simply know about this unity. It's not sufficient that it exists in the secret places of our minds. It must be worked out. Jesus wants the world to know it. And He wants the world to know it through us. And ultimately, all of creation is going to know it when we're all gathered in one glorious church. I talked about that this morning, that glorious church without spot or wrinkle. There's still a few spots and wrinkles, at least practically speaking, in our church existence in this world. But it seems to me that this prayer moves toward this idea of our life now in the world in verse 23. In verse 24, he, he goes beyond, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. He, he does think about that future day, but he's in verse 23, I think, he has, I think he has his mind set upon the outworking of this now. Our unity says something profound to the world about God as they view us. And our lack of unity also says something to the world about our God and our relationship to our God. Let's think about this a little bit more. I in them, verse 23, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Made perfect. This is language of completeness. Language of maturity. I don't think he's talking about an instantaneous thing here. I think this is something that we are progressing unto. In fact, I believe the word that he uses here when he says that they may be made perfect. The, the translation made perfect may not indicate completely that it is something progressive. It's sort of questionable. The verb tense that's used there. But then he uses the word made perfect in one. That translation of the word in there, it's a different word than the other words translated in. And I, I forgot to see what the ESV translated there, but it, if it says in two, that's a, a better, I think a, a better rendering because it is the word into or unto. That they may be made perfect unto one. In other words, this is, this is a direction. This is... This is the way that we are to be moving as 
the children of God. We haven't arrived there, but we're moving there. And we ought to be moving there. This word, made perfect, is used over in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at several other references that I think may be helpful. Ephesians 4, I've alluded to this passage already. But he says in verse 12, for the, this is the purpose of these gifts that have been given to the church and the ministry that takes place for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, here it is, perfect man. Unto a perfect man. That's the goal. That's the direction. That's what Jesus is, I think, a similar idea for which He is praying. A perfect man, which includes this unity. Unity of the faith here in Ephesians chapter 4. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Made perfect in one. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. He uses this word again. I'm going to spend a little time in 1 John chapter 4. First John 4 and verse 12. He says, No man hath seen God at any time. Now he's been talking about the love of God. He's been talking about the manifestation of the love of God. He's talking about Christ becoming a propitiate, being a propitiation for our sins. He's talking about these glorious gospel realities. And then he throws in this seemingly strange idea in the midst of what he's talking about. No man has seen God at any time. Then he says, if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is, here's the word, perfected in us. So you can see right away that there is a, a link between love and unity. I mean, unity requires relationships, and relationships require love. If you don't have this love, you're not going to have the right relationships, and you'll never experience this unity. And so John is arguing in 1 John for evidences of the unseen God. No man has seen God at any time. Well, how do we know that God is? How do we know that God sent His Son? How do, he's really arguing some of the same things that Jesus is praying for, that the world may know, believe and may know, that they may see. God, that they may see that Christ came. And what does he say? No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and His love is perfected in us. And I'm concluding that this is the way in which the world does see God, is the manifestation of love in the people of God toward one another. You know what Paul says of, in Colossians 3 and verse 14, that love which is the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. God in us. Love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit that enables the fullness of unity. In Colossians 3 and verse 14. He says this is the bond of... The King James says the bond of perfectness. The bond of perfection. The glue that, that brings this full maturity of unity. The New American Standard translate that, translates that perfect bond of unity. Colossians 3.14, And above all these things put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. Which is the perfect bond of unity. Can we really expect to experience this kind of unity with other believers? the kind of unity for which Jesus prays. Can we really expect that? Or would you, do, we just, do we just have to chalk this up to this is just something future? I mean, Jesus didn't expect for us to aim for that here. He didn't really... I mean, He wasn't convinced that could happen. Come on, that, that's not possible. We have to wait for heaven for that. Or can we experience it? And I'm suggesting to you, maybe more, more than suggesting to you, that we can experience it. 
But the only way is if God is in us. Isn't that what Jesus prays? He says, I in them and thou in me. I in them and thou in me. That's what he says in John 17, 23. Really, Jesus sounds repetitious, doesn't he? He's really making a point of this. I in them and thou in me. In order that they may be made perfect in one. Yeah, it's, it's possible, but it's not possible in your own, in your own strength, not in your f- flesh. And this takes us back to 1 John chapter 4. Verse 12 again, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. I in them, and thou in me. And His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. That's a key. His Spirit in us. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The world will know, believe, that He sent the Son. That's what Jesus is praying for. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Powerful words. If the Spirit is, if the Spirit is in us, we have the love of God in us. You see, we have the capacity to do what, what Christ prays for. We have the capacity to be perfected, to move toward this maturity, this completeness, this bond of unity in our relationships to one another. The Spirit of Christ in us produces this fruit that results in, this, in the experience of unity. May I, may I, I'm not going to emphasize this, but may I say that we can get in the way. You know the concepts of quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit. Don't you know that that's one of the primary ways in which we do that is in this conflict that we have with one another. You read Ephesians chapter 4, the end of the chapter, you see that's one of the things that Paul is talking about. We're to be dwelling together with this spirit of forgiveness. Dealing with those sins that get in the way of proper relationships. So Jesus prays that essential unity be manifested experientially to the world as a witness to Him. And as we grow in the expression of unity with other believers, we are validating the claims of the gospel of Jesus Christ in and to the world. We're validating it. Is it important that we validate it? I say yes. According to the prayer of Jesus. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now we rightly emphasize preaching. We rightly emphasize, declare the word, proclaim the gospel. And we love to hear preachers do this. That word which came from the apostles. We're in line with them. Our doctrinal statements are strong expressions of apostolic doctrine. And we stand upon that, and we ought to. But you go read read Revelation chapter 2 about a church that had all that in order and yet left the first love. You see, we, we say that Jesus is God sent by the Father to the earth on a mission to rescue sinners. That's what we say. 
We say that the Father has loved us as He has loved His very own Son. That's what Jesus prays. We say that. And it can make us feel good, and it ought to make us feel good if we really know that reality. We talk about that love being everlasting. We sing about that love, that fervent love. We even get emotional as we talk about it and sing about it. It was before the foundation of the world. He set His love upon us. And we ought to revel in those, in those glorious truths. Those aren't just theories. That's a reality. We talk about that love being fervent and self-emptying and sacrificial. Are you hearing this? We, we talk about that. We talk about it being complete and constant. We talk about it. We talk about being brought into the eternal love relationship of the Father and Son. And we can go for days out all by ourselves just getting lost in the wonders of that reality. We say that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We speak of God's love manifested as 1 John 4, 9 and 10 speak very clearly. Sending His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We say it. We say it. We talk about it. And we ought to. But do we love as He loved? Beloved, if God so loved you, you ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 11. Made perfect in one, Jesus prays. That's more than simply talking theology. It's relationship. It's relationship that results from theology worked into our souls. It's the fruit of eternal life. It's the fruit of knowing God. It's the fruit of knowing His Son. When is the last time you actually prayed in the context of your own world, your own regular life and church life? When have, when's the last time you prayed, God, help me not to be a stumbling block to this unity for which you have prayed? Rather than accusing everyone else of being the problem, when's the last time you prayed that you wouldn't be the problem? You see, while, while this unity is with all believers, and that's one of the beauties of a setting like this, we can get together as we share our testimonies. I heard a brother's testimony today, and it's just like excitement in my soul hearing what God had done. Again, I just registered goosebumps. You know, God's at work in people's lives. And it's... It's, and I, I didn't have to, I mean, eventually if we talked long enough, I, well, I think he told me what church he was part of, but I'd probably want to know because I think that's important, but that wasn't my leading question or concern. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Are you in Christ with me? But you see this, works itself out, as I have repeatedly said, in our local context, our local churches, with those people that we are regularly gathering with, taking this bread and breaking it, one bread, and we are saying we're one. And we're drinking a cup together. We're saying we're one. But oftentimes... It's just simply only true positionally if it's true at all. But you know, if, you've, if you know the Scriptures, that this whole idea of the Lord's Supper is more than just positional unity. 1 Corinthians 11 is clear. 1 Corinthians 5. 
It should be an expression of that which exists, which really does exist in our churches. So there is a bond that we have in Christ that all who know us should see. What's the goal? What does Jesus say? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Here's another in order that. And in order that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That the world, that the world, he said earlier, that the world may believe now, that the world may know. The world. Unbelieving family members. You you take your family to church. Your children. And they may not be understanding a word that's being said from the pulpit, but they understand what they see in you. And they understand what you talk about around the dinner table after church. Those cutting evaluations of so-and-so. Those expressions that really ought not be coming out of your mouth about so-and-so. Your children hear that. You're impressing them. I'm saying, that's the world. Your unbelieving family members. Your neighbors. Our, Our culture at large. Whether they actually come to possess eternal life or not, our relationship with one another should confirm that what we say of God is true. It's real. Listen, godly unity is really not so much about you and me. Oh, I like the feeling of unity. I hate division. I hate it when it's even necessary. We'll say more about that probably tomorrow, but... Sometimes it is necessary. And I don't like it. But the reason unity is so important isn't because I, it makes me feel good. And, and, and it's not just so people will say about your church and my church, what a, what a unified group they are. Although that, that would be nice if they were able to say that. In other words, it's not about you and me. and It's not just about our church. It's about the testimony, the testimony that we bear to the world. About our God. About our Savior. About what He has done in our lives. Godly unity is so that the grabbing from verse 21, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent Me. That the world may believe. You can argue theologically. You you can make the best arguments. I mean, nobody can defeat your theological arguments about Jesus and God sent His Son and you've got it so tightly wrapped up that you can defeat anyone in a debate. But then they see you. And they see that you're squabbling. Everywhere you go, it seems like there's contention that chases you. Read First Timothy. I mean, there's, there's, there's always something stirring around that person. And in that church, that's a, that's a problem. The world sees that. And it doesn't matter how great your arguments are. Take somebody who isn't quite as gifted as you are with debating and yet lives it out. And just their simple testimony, their simple words will have more of an impact than your brainy apologetics. By the way, I'm not against apologetics. Just making a point here of how important this is. 
And the world actually says, you know what? This thing about Jesus might be believable. <laughs> you know? There might be something to it. That the world may know, he says in verse 23. Believe that the world may know. That the world may know that the sending of, of His Son was an expression of the Father's love. But He says, The world may know that Thou hast sent Me and hast loved them as You've loved Me. This was an expression of divine love. But there's, there's so many differences there's so many differences of thought. There's so many differences of convictions among us, aren't there? Haven't you found that to be the case? I could go down a list. I've got a few of them written down here. Now, I'll tell you, if you don't homeschool, I question whether you really have a relationship with God. There is that kind of thinking. How about dress? How about music? How about observance of days? How about diets? How about Bible translations? I've been... This doesn't have to be confession time, does it? <laughs> Nuances of doctrine? Eh, I don't think you quite got that. I'm not sure you should even be in our church. And the application of doctrine? Do we even think people should be given a period of time to grow? Or do they have to walk in the doors where you are? Oh, aren't you somebody? You've gotten somewhere, haven't you? If everybody was just like you. That's sometimes the spirit that we, we give off. As if we got where we got by our own power. And by the way, the things that I just mentioned are not the basis for unity, not, not essential unity. Christ is the basis. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. How will you ever get along? How will you ever find a church? You know there's people that jump from church to church to church to church trying to find the church that fits them. Which they, ne they never will find that. They're looking for the wrong thing. How are we going to get along? How about this? Dwelling on the depths of the Father's love, that they may know that Thou hast sent Me and hast loved them as You have loved Me. The Father's love for His Son. Son is the... This is amazing. I, I, I mean, it's equated to the Father's love for us. How about that? Unworthy imperfect sinners like you and me. He didn't pick the cream of the crop. I'm so thankful that God's work in my own heart is such that I can stand and talk to 50 some odd men wearing white. And I can look them, I can look at them at this level. I'm not looking down. At them, and I can look at them at this level, and though I've never done what they have done, I don't, I honestly can say, I don't have a feeling of a superiority to them. And I'm not suggesting when I say that, young people and children, go do what those guys have done that are wearing white. You may not even know what I'm talking about, that's okay, but I'm not, I'm not suggesting that at all. You shouldn't do those things. I'm just saying before God, who are you and who am I? He has set His love upon me for no reason found in me, for no re reason found in you. That ought to help us in our relationships. You celebrate Christmas? I don't. I love you, brother. I'm not going to chalk you up as some sort of pagan. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dwell together with you in a relationship. You want to know why I don't? I'll listen to why you do. Right? 
And we can, we can talk. Maybe we can help one another. Maybe both of us are off center. Maybe, 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 maybe we need to grow together. But being amazed that He loves us as He has loved His only begotten Son, that ought to help us deal with our distinctions. And You see, when redeemed sinners from... I love looking out here today and tonight and seeing... I don't know if every ethnicity in the world is present, but there's quite a lot of differences here. Are there any Asians here? Asians? Okay. I love that when I look at our own church and, and we have the multiplicity. I, lo I love that. It kind of looks like... I don't know exactly what it's going to be like in heaven, but I kind of have a picture it's going to kind of look like that. So why not on earth? But when, when redeemed sinners from every background of life, not just different ethnicities, backgrounds, some of you are educated, some of you are not, some of you are wealthy... Are you wealthy? Well, some of you are wealthy and some of you are not. <laughs> Different classes of people. Some of you grew up in the hood. Some of you didn't. But none of that matters when you're in Christ, does it? It really doesn't. It, it's like it all evaporates. All the cultural distinctions... We come together and we worship and we serve the Lord together, demonstrating selfless, sacrificial relationships. Brethren, that's an evidence to the world that the Father's love is real. It's real. Christ is real. And it's interesting to me that God wants the world to know about His love by way of what they see in our relationship to one another. He could, he could have... He said, well, I thought the cross demonstrated His love. Well, the greatest manifestation of God's love is at the cross. But you see, it's our relationship of unity because of our union with God in Christ that validates that story of the cross, you see. And God has chosen that it would be our demonstration of unity that would speak to the world about His great love that we have come to know. Have you taken the expression of unity seriously, as seriously as you ought to with your brothers and sisters in Christ? It ought to grieve you where there's a breach in unity. It really ought to grieve you. It ought to burden us. As churches, we ought to be upon our faces before God in prayer over this matter. Join Christ in His praying. Let's purpose afresh to respond in obedience to the will of God expressed in Jesus' prayer that we be made perfect in one. Now Paul expresses it this way. We're going to pick up here tomorrow, Lord willing. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So you have a responsibility in this thing, don't you? And I do too. Let's not shirk it. And where we have been a... And all of us need to be honest about this. Where we have been a, a problem. Let's be honest about that. If you need to confess that to somebody, confess it to somebody. But maybe it's just you've had a problem in your own heart about it. Talk to God about it. Deal with Him about it. Confess it to Him. And ask Him by His presence in you, the Holy Spirit, to create in you, to increase that fruit of love that you might be able to be a part of this progression of unity that our witness to the world would be greater than it already is. Amen. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this privilege of thinking through these matters together. I know, there's, I know there's much more that could be said. I know that there are wrong directions that our minds can go. I, I know that we can come short. I, I know there's in us there's so many problems. We are just asking, Holy Spirit, that You will guide in the application of Your Word 
and the clarification of the truth of your word, the imparting and the deep rooting, the engrafting of that word, that we truly would be affected in a greater way from this day forward. In Christ's name I pray, amen.